Okay, coming to you live from Ann Arbor, Michigan, it's the Rob Wodo One Show. Welcome everyone, um, I'm Professor Jesse Grizzle. We'll go over the whole team that's been working on getting this course prepared to offer, to pilot um, this fall term. As you probably saw on our course page, we were planning to do this hybrid even before COVID hit. We just weren't planning to do it in masks, okay? So <laughs> that's the main thing, and we we're planning not to have any social distancing and stuff, but um, we're going to be hybrid anyway, so I think everything's going to work out. What I'm going to do is just start the lecture the way I will normally start one, and then we'll go and do all of the course in introductory um, stuff. Okay, so the way I typically start a lecture is I have a quick review here of the things that we covered from the previous lecture. Um, so this is just to give a quick reminder of the highlights so that when we start again, there's some continuity in the intellectual progression. And so the only thing we're assuming in Rob 101 is that you're um, familiar with high school algebra, and so taking it to linear algebra is going to be kind of a natural progression. Um, so you would need to know something about quadratic equations. That is reviewed in the very first part of chapter one. The discriminant, which helps you determine whether you have real roots, repeated roots, or complex roots. Now, what, I've got the word complex there. It seems to imply we're going to be using complex numbers in Rob 101, and we may towards the very end of the course, but if we do, we will review what is a complex number, et cetera. If you've read through the first chapter, there's a little bit of history of numbers I've thrown in there just for fun about, you know, why do we call 3 over 4 a rational number? Why do we call square root of 2 an irrational number? because it cannot be written as a ratio of two integers. And then why do we have these things called imaginary numbers? You know, it's kind of a strange vocabulary, you have to admit. But even if we would like to rewrite the history of mathematics and change the vocabulary, we will not do that in Rob 101, because then when you go into your next course, you'd be using a different language than everybody else, and then you'd be treated like an idiot, okay? So I'm not gonna set you up for Failure that way. Um, so today, everybody's wearing a mask. Thank you for being uh, compliant. Thank you for helping us all stay safe. And the procedure when you walk into the classroom is to take one of the wipes. Take one of the wipes, and hopefully there are still some there. Clean your desk area and um, use the wipe when you leave to wipe your area down, though the next class, when they come in, they should wipe it down. So, so anyway, that's how it works. Um, so here's the things we want to go through, the course organization, operational agreement, grading, and the Canvas course page. So the, let's start with the operational agreement. So the first thing we teach our graduate students, and I know you guys aren't graduate students, but the first thing we teach our graduate students in the robotics program is to ask for help. Because robotics is such a huge field that even I, as director of the institute, I only know maybe a quarter of what's going on in the field really well, okay? So I need help when I do things. When we do autonomy on CASI, I cannot do that all alone. I'm an expert in the feedback control. I understand what's going on in the perception and some of the map building, but I'm not state of the art in that. So I ask for help. And we want you guys to do the same, okay? We want you to um, get help when you need it and don't feel like that's a sign of weakness because we want you to know that it's a sign of respect for your fellow colleagues, for, your, for the instructional staff, that you respect your colleagues' knowledge and the fact that they will treat you with respect back, okay? That you're respecting that. And the thing I really want to happen in Rob 101 is we build a great climate so that we can all learn together and be comfortable and et cetera. 
So part of that is I've looked at the backgrounds that you're coming in with, and it's kind of amazing, okay, where some of you are. Um, once again, our assumption is you have no programming background, we're gonna build from zero, and you have no linear algebra background, we're gonna build from zero there. But many of you have gone considerably beyond that, and it may make you feel super smart, and et cetera, but just try to remember that not all of us are in the same place at the same time. I mean, personally, I'm from a high school where trigonometry was not taught. You guys are going like, that was possible? Even back in the 1800s when Grizzle was born? Okay, yes, okay. So in rural Oklahoma where I grew up, high schools were not offering calculus, much less trigonom, I mean, we're not offering trigonometry, much less calculus, okay. So I had a lot of catching up to do, and, but I did it, okay. The time I graduated, I was ahead of everybody else who had done all the AP calculus, because I love math. <laughs> So what I want you to do is just be humble with your knowledge and help other people who maybe don't have all of the same skills. And if you take that into account when you're making comments on what somebody's question is, you'll make all of us feel much, much better, okay? All of these notes, by the way, will be posted on the course website. Um, yes, the lecture is being recorded and you can get them that way, but I will put everything I write and everything on the tablet will be posted on the course website independently. I encourage you to take notes, but you don't have to take notes like for the in operational agreement. Um, a lot of our, what we know is from personal experience, but it, maybe it's not based upon a lot of data. So that's another reason to hold your opinions with, um, with Humility and to always think about the broader group level dynamics when we're talking and interacting because I hope this class becomes something where we grow it together. I mean, it, it is the pilot semester and it's going to have some rough spots in it. It's not a class that's been running for 35 years, okay, like calculus one or two or three or four or differential equations or the math version of linear algebra. It's just different. Um, I have defensive reactions, I'm sure you do, if somebody starts criticizing the Robotics Institute, and since I'm the director, boy, the hairs on the back of my head go straight up, okay? Arr. But I've learned that I've had a defensive reaction to that, and then I try to you know, calm down and just think about it, okay? So hope you will do the same. Um, because I'm a white male, I can do almost anything in society of no fear of being shot, thrown in jail arbitrarily. Um, nobody doubts my ability to learn math. Nobody doubts my ability to know anything. I could claim I have knowledge about something I don't have and everybody will say, yeah, he's a white guy, old experience, he probably knows it. Okay, so I can bluff my way through anything. It's because I'm a white male. Um, if I had been a white female, colored, excuse me, a brown or black female, a female of color, Maybe I was told that I can't do STEM, okay? Maybe I was told I can't do programming. Maybe I was told that I'm not good enough to be there, okay? So everybody should just treat each other with respect. And then finally, um, this last lines are probably more for social studies classes because I don't think we're gonna debate politics or religion, et cetera, but um, there's a difference between safety and comfort. And I'm uncomfortable teaching Rob 101 in the pilot semester. Um, I don't know if you are uncomfortable being in a pilot version of a course where you don't know if anyone else will respect what you're learning or not. But I'm uncomfortable that I could destroy you, I could break you, I could ruin you, your entire college existence, okay? Better not happen, right? <laughs> Tribby's gonna make sure it doesn't happen, okay? Right, Tribby? <laughs> there you go. So we've got one person, um, one person on your side. So let me open up the course webpage really quick. <sighs> Let's 
Okay, so this is our Canvas page. It's loaded with information. Um, we put out announcements. You've seen some of those, the lecture recordings. You'll be able to go here and get them. There's nothing here yet, but today's recording will be available by 11.30 or so. Um, a Lumi desk. So this is how you will access your homeworks when we start doing the programming part of the course. So this week, there's no homework, and then there is no optional recitation section this week. This week is just us getting going and getting started. The first homework is next week, and then you would come here and you'll start your server. And then, okay, I'm seeing the professor version of the server when it opens. You'll see the student version of the server when it opens. But you'll have your notebook that's available to work on. Your projects will show up here, et cetera. So that's called the Lumi Desk, and it's on the left-hand um, tab. We'll worry about grade scope a little bit more next week, but this is where you will turn in the drill problems. Your homework sets will have a set of drill problems, and by drill problems, I mean they're just like the classic things. There's two equations and two unknowns. There's a three by three matrix when we define what a matrix is, but there's not 150 by 150 matrix in the drill problems. They're just hand calculations. It's when we do the Julia programming that we do mathematics at scale. And the drill problems, being very honest, they're just to practice the stuff we've done. And they're boring, and it, but you just go through them and you, you will then use your phone or any device you want that, where you can take a PDF image and Gradescope has a preferred app, but you can use any app you want, and you upload a PDF, and then we will grade them online, and you'll get your scores back. So that's what Gradescope is about. Files. So I don't know if you found the booklet. Notes for computational linear algebra. So I started writing that at the end of April. Um, ten chapters are pretty much done. The eleventh one is two thirds of the way done, and we've got um, most of the homeworks uh, created, etc. There's information about the course organization. So in the syllabus, for example. You know, the university's policy on masks, um, how to get extra help. So the recitation sessions, they're optional. It's not an official part of the course. Attendance is not taken even in lecture, much less recitation. You don't get any points for recitation. It's just there for help. It's something in between office hours and lecture. OK, so it's just to give you more uh, experience with problems, et cetera. And they'll be run by Tribby. Tribby, she's sitting in the back. She's a PhD student in robotics. She's already completed her master's degree. She probably knows more robotics than I do, OK? And um, so she's fantastic. She's been working with us all summer, some of the topics, and then the grading policy. So looks like we're going to settle on eight weekly homeworks, will drop your two lowest homework scores automatically. Now, normally that's to take care of you traveling for a student team or something. Uh, not so much student team competitions this year. It's to handle when the dog eats your homework, which is hard to do when it's a PDF file, but you know, it still happens today, believe it or not. It's to handle when you're sick. It's to handle when you've got too many exams going on in some other uh, course or something. So everybody drops two. We'll grade six of the eight, and that'll be 15% of your grade. There are no exams. 
part of the philosophy of Rob 101 is that in your first semester, your GPA should not be at risk. You should be able to enjoy learning, find out what you're good at, find out if you're going to enjoy the atmosphere here, if mathematics is your thing, if the engineering problems we open up is what you want to do. So my hope is everybody gets really strong grades, and we're not going to be uh, killing you with exams. And they'd be hard to proctor and do fair anyway under this situation. So we're not doing any exams. We're doing three projects, and I'll tell you about them in just a second. There'll be probably six multiple choice quizzes that we'll post on the uh, Canvas page. And the beautiful thing about them is they're posted for a week. You can consult any source you want, um, and then they'll be due. And then uh, we'll grade, uh, we'll drop your lowest quiz. OK? So we're trying to give every possibility for everybody to get really good uh, scores. The homework, because we're dropping um, the two lowest, there's no late homework. So um, that's just the way it is. The other pieces of the grade is a final presentation where you could do a video or a short paper on anything about computational mathematics. That should be OK. That's kind of in place of a final, I guess, but not really. And then class participation. Um, the university does teaching evaluations. There's a midterm one and a final one. And you'll get points for turning those in. And then otherwise, um, once again, being here is not really how you get points, though. It's much easier to teach to an audience than it is to just Tribby sitting in the back, as wonderful as that is, OK? Um, but the class participation is helping, you know, posing questions on Piazza, answering questions on Piazza, et cetera. And I'll show you what Piazza is in just a minute. But it's a chat tool where you can use LaTeX, which is a way to do equations, OK? So you can, but after that. Questions so far? Am I speaking too quickly? Oklahoma accent coming through, or is the Midwestern dominating this morning? OK, you're looking at me like he's a... You can hear it a little bit? Yeah, you're from where? Michigan. Ah, OK. <laughs> so it's not exactly Midwestern. I've tried. Um, so this is Piazza. Um, if we just were to go to, say, homework one, um, there's no posts there yet. Um, the textbook, et cetera. And you can just start doing a new post and saying, uh, I don't know, textbook, you could type better, is awesome. OK, whoops. That just earned you 25 points, OK? So as soon as you say that, uh, you're going to have my age with you. Uh, but no, the thing there is that if you find typos, errors, if you find something that's not clear and you'd like extra examples to, to make it, you think it would help, um, that, would be, uh, that would be great uh, too, OK? And then you can do it as a draft. Post my note, summary, commentary to earn the favor of the prof. What do you think? <laughs> OK, I don't take myself seriously enough. I know that's really bad. Um, pages. So you should go through the thing. There's lots of stuff. You get grade scope links, other stuff like my web page, all those Cassie videos, um, the short lectures. So today's lecture is summarized in six minutes. It doesn't have all this preamble stuff, just the math, OK? Summarized in six minutes. Cool. Um, OK. Let's go back to where we were. OK, why Rob 101? Why not? OK, 
So this was course is the, the genius behind this course. The creator is Professor Chad Jenkins. He's our Associate Director for Undergraduate Affairs in the Robotics Institute. We started a graduate program seven years ago, and we're starting to roll out an undergraduate program. I'm Jesse Grizzle. Monty Gaffari is the uh, co-instructor. He's concentrating on the videos. I'm doing uh, writing of the book and some of the homeworks. Tribby is our graduate student instructor. We don't use the word TA, teaching assistant at Michigan. I don't know why, but um, we don't. We have two undergraduate assistants. They're called instructional assistants. One of them is Kira Beener. And Kira will specialize in Julia. So she'll be helping you with the uh, programming assignments. Tribby doesn't get to specialize. She has to cover everything total. So you can go to Tribby for anything, OK? Um, Kira will be monitoring Piazza very carefully when you start doing your first um, learning of Julia and stuff. And she'll be there to give you tips and answer your questions. And Xiao Shang Yao, he's a, um, a senior in computer science. And he's going to do the math, OK? So you might think it's a little bit different that uh, he should be doing the, the Julia programming. No. He's a C++ guy, et cetera, but not so much Julia. And he's going to help us with the linear algebra. It's three credits, in person and remote. A um, whole bunch of other people have helped put this course together over the summer. Miley and Madoff were super amazing contributors working with us. And then oh, essentially, I pestered all of the PhD students in my lab, OK? So uh, Grant and Eva and Ray and Bruce and it's Wami. Um, yeah, poor guys. Um, so why linear algebra and not just start with calculus, since you guys have this great background in calculus? So what we find is that with calculus, you don't get to do any real engineering examples until you're maybe a junior. And so what happens is students are saying here, hey, I came to the University of Michigan to be an engineer. And they don't feel like engineers. They feel like they're doing drill problems in calculus, then drill problems in the math version of linear algebra, then drill problems in the math version of differential equations. And they don't feel like they're an engineer. And then when they're in their first circuits course, or F equals MA course, or flight dynamics course. It's all little problems because they don't have the right programming background to do things at the scale of life. And so this course is designed so that by week three, you can work with a set of equations with 250 variables in it, OK? Yeah. And you're going to know stuff that only graduate students in robotics might know more in certain aspects of linear algebra. I know it seems weird. Um, so we put theory and computation together. And Chad Jenkins says programming equals believing. When you take all of the math and you convert it into code. And the beautiful thing about Julia you write the equations the same way in the programming language as you write them on a sheet of paper. Now, it has some little quirks, and they will drive you nuts in the beginning. But once again, frustration, that's, that's just part of learning. But Kira's here to help you. Tribby's here to help you. I'm here to help you. Monty's here to help you get over that. Julia has some small quirks. It's not as user friendly as MATLAB, but you'll be better set up for learning C and advanced programming languages from Julia, and you'll convert to MATLAB quickly when you get into a course that assumes MATLAB. Just say, yeah, I know MATLAB. OK? You don't, but you do. There's a few little tricks, then you'll be able to get that over. And so this course is really designed to shorten the path to real things. You'd be able to get into computer vision, which requires linear algebra and computation. You'd be able to get into machine learning. You can take a course in robot navigation and path planning. You can do that much more quickly and feel like you're an actual engineer. Um, 
There's many of us who feel that the emphasis on AP calculus is misplaced. We're trying to get you into math independent of zip code. And then um, calculus is kind of a Sputnik thing. You guys know what Sputnik is? This Russian satellite that went up and caused this scientific revolution, caused governments to start investing in research and all of this stuff, okay? so. Yep, you come here, you take Calc 1, Calc 2, Calc 3, Calc 4, differential equations in linear algebra, and then you start doing engineering. Well, today, it's all about data, autonomy, sensing, perception, and that's based upon linear algebra. So we want you to get going in linear algebra. We, we're working with the university to turn that calculus sequence into two semesters because you do not need to know 27 ways to change the variable under an integral to get a closed form solution. You just don't need that. 26, maybe, no. You just need a few, okay? So that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do, but you know, we're leading the revolution and et cetera. Um, here's the projects. The first one is map building, led by Trivi. We will take data from Cassie. You see how the camera is rolling Sideways, rolling, rolling, rolling. Well, how come the LiDAR data is not rolling? <laughs> because there's motion compensation going on, okay? Those LiDAR points, there's at least 10,000 points here. They're all vectors in three space. And you will learn how to take information about the local position of the robot and transform those points into a fixed coordinate frame so that it looks like they're all were taken as if the robot were just sitting here at this one place the whole time. Okay, that's called image registration or motion compensation, and project one is built around that. The second project is built around machine learning. So we're gonna use linear regression, which is what we teach here. It's how you solve linear equations that don't have an exact solution. You're going like, wait a minute, how do you solve your equation? I don't have an exact solution. Well, imagine you've got three points and you want to put a line that approximates them. Oh, data. They don't all fall on the line, but I can take and find a line that minimizes the error that fits through my points. Well, you don't have to do it with just lines. You can do it with much more interesting functions than lines, and that's what project two does. And that's being led by Madov and Kira. And then project three <laughs> is you're gonna learn how to control a Segway. Now it'll be a planar Segway, and Cassie will not be riding your Segway, okay? But we're gonna use optimal control to do feedback on a Segway model. That'll be optimization, and so we're gonna learn enough optimization to be dangerous. Whoops, let me stop this so I can actually hear. Question. So the first one, the virtual thing, the last one, you see like an actual robot, you get a robot on Of course, yeah, we're gonna give everybody a, a, a segue. <laughs> the question was, the first two are virtual, and then is the third one gonna be on a physical robot, and that would just be too wonderful. Okay, but you'll be working with models. Yeah, that would just be way too wonderful. Um, our plan is we have Rob 101, which is mathematical foundations and computing. We're gonna roll out Rob 102, which is programming at scale. We just do a, enough programming to be dangerous, but not to be really good in Rob 101. And then Rob 103 is reintroducing shop into engineering, but shop with modern tools, laser cutters, um, 3D printers that you guys have used, and you would then build an omnidirectional robot and take all the knowledge you have from Rob 101 and Rob 102 and do path planning and everything on your robot. That's Rob 103. Hopefully, fall 21, we start rolling those out. Another question. Is uh, 102 going to be required to take 103? So the question is, because just so the people on Zoom can hear is, is Rob 102 uh, going to be a prereq for Rob 103? I think we're going to make them co-requisites and learn them at the same time. So that's our plan. So you guys are amazing. You're piloting. Um, you're piloting 
Rob 101, there'll be another group that pilots 102 and 103, and maybe we can let you guys get back in there and do some of that. Okay, we have a little bit of time for some equations. Ready? Start math? Okay. Trivi, they haven't all left yet. No, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> okay. Okay. So maybe when they see how bad my handwriting is. Um, so systems of linear equations. Is the board supposed to be on? It's not? <laughs> well. Yeah, it's supposed uh, to be on. Okay. Jesse, can you hear me? Yeah, Monty, I can hear you. We, now we can see your screen. Yeah, I don't know what happened, Monty, but uh, thanks for um, seeing if uh, anybody was alive in this room. They'd all just fall. We'd all, we all fell asleep together, and the board went off, okay? <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> fantastic. So systems of linear equations. So, typically means more than one. But you know, if you just have the quadratic equation or something, um, <clears throat> you typically just look at one often, okay. You know, and it could be a whole bunch of different things. Um, X plus Y plus Z plus W equals zero. X minus Y plus Z minus W equals plus one. It doesn't matter. These are just kind of random uh, digits I'm generating here. Okay, so this would be four equations. And the four unknowns, X, Y, Z, W. Exclamation point because we're excited, okay? We won't use the true mathematical meaning of the exclamation point, which you guys sometimes know for factorial, but it also means the word unique. Okay, we'll learn some vocabulary as we go. Now, it's a set of linear equations because um, what power is x raised to? One. Where is cosine of x in the equation? Not. Where is logarithm of z in the equation? It's not, okay, so that's why it's linear. Okay, there's no nonlinear terms, so it's not very precise, but it's precise enough uh, for us. Now, here's the big deal. A system of linear equations. can have, it can have no solutions, and we'll talk about that. It can have a unique solution, and unique means one and only one solution. Okay, so that's different than the, a quadratic equation. It typically has two, okay? Sometimes it's repeated, or if we're only looking for real solutions, it could have no solutions as well because the discriminant on the quadratic equation was negative, so we have to use complex numbers. 
And there was a time in mathematics where we didn't admit the existence of complex numbers. We called them imaginary numbers because they were really a figment of somebody's imagination. You had to be crazy to think square root of minus one actually had a meaning, okay? The other thing is you can have an infinite number of solutions number of solutions. But here's the thing. Cannot have two and only two solutions. Cannot have five and only five, okay? Cannot have seven and only seven, et cetera, okay? It's either zero, one, or infinity. There's nothing in between. That's the number of solutions. <clears throat> okay. Um. Bingo, okay, no solution. If we do minus 2x plus y equals 2, and I'll call that equation a.1, and if we do minus 4x plus 2y equals minus 2, I'll call that equation A.2. <laughs> okay, so why do we have no solutions? Well, one of these lines looks like this, and the other line looks like that. They're parallel. <laughs> what does a solution mean? It means there's a point in common, right, between the two equations. And Euclid told us if two lines are parallel and they go off forever, they will never meet, okay? That's Euclidean geometry. So it's, once you draw the picture, it's clear, right? Well, how do you show that? Okay, so no solution, we get it. You know, this slope is two, that slope is two, they're parallel. Well. A.1 implies that, let's see, let's bring everything on the other side and get y. So y is 2x plus 2. And now what we're going to assume is that there's a point in common between A.1 and A.2. So let's take the, 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 the uh, constraint that we have on y, the relationship between y and x, and put it into the second equation. So we substitute y equals 2x plus 2 into a point 2, and we end up with what? Well. We have minus 4x plus 2 times y, and now y is 2x plus 2 equals minus 2. And then we have minus 4x plus 4x plus 4 equals minus 2. But this guy cancels with this guy. And so we're left with 4 equals minus 2. And that's a contradiction. Right? I mean, at least last time I checked, 4 and minus 2 were distinct uh, integers. OK? So the, what are we contradicting? We're contradicting that a.1 and a point 
two have a common solution, have a point in common, let's put it that way. The logic on that work for you? Yeah, okay. Now, I know you guys had it just from the picture, but when we have 17 variables and 17 unknowns, how's that picture gonna work for us? Mm, not so well. I'm gonna show you a little bit three variables and three unknowns, you're gonna go like, uh, okay. So it has no solution. Let's do a unique solution. Did this just go off? No. Just okay. Unique solution. Let's do. Um, so unique means there's one and only one. So we'll do 3x minus 3y equals 3. And then we'll do x plus y equals 7. And we'll call this equation b.1 and this equation b.2. I'll do my plot. Funny how that looks so nice and then you look on the other side and it's, oh well, you know, it is what it is. Okay, so what do these equations look like? So this looks like y equals minus x plus seven, right? Okay, so that's something that goes like at a 45 degree angle, something like this, okay? And then the threes are just what? Extra baggage here, okay? So we divide by three. And then this is um, minus, well, we bring the y over here, and y equals then x uh, minus one. Um, <clears throat> okay? And then, so, Something like that, okay? There's the solution. Now what's the number? Okay, so how do we find the number? So, does this seem like high school stuff? Yeah, I understand. Remember, we're starting from zero and we're gonna go slow, and then we're gonna ramp up, and then you guys will start feeling like college students, but not so much today. You're just getting used to me, the environment, how the courses run, and um, I'm hopefully you won't just give up on us because thinking is never, ever, ever going to get interesting. Okay, so 3x is equal to 3y plus three. That's what b.1 implies. We divide by three, so x equals y plus three, uh, one. Fake myself out there. We substitute into equation B.2. Okay, so we have a value for x. So in place of x, we put y plus one. Then we have y, and that equals seven. And so two y equals seven minus one equals six. That implies y equals three. Yay, whoops. Okay, so now we know the value of y. How do we get the value of x? We can plug it into either of those two equations. It doesn't matter. Okay, it doesn't matter. You can check. I'll do, uh, which one am I doing? 
I'm doing B.2, okay? So I'm going to substitute substitute y equals 3 into b.2. And so what do I do there? I'll have x plus 3 equals 7. What is that? Uh, bad imitation of Chinese character. OK, and so x equals 4. And so the answer, which eventually we're going to want to write as x, y, and I'm just going to stack them up like this, is 4, comma, 3. So that's the answer. My floating base has the origin at the hip, not the foot. OK, Grant, I thought I had those turned off. Um, uh, whoops. Now, what we haven't seen is now infinity of solutions. Quick. So, Tribby, I can't hear you very well. Oh, yeah, no, I should be below, yeah. I don't know how that happened. Um, yeah, so, no, I meant for that. I thought I was drawing it down below, so I don't know if I can do that. I can. Perfect, like that, yeah. No, thanks for catching that. And then, stay where you are. This is the solution, and I don't know what that is. OK, we'll put a question mark there. <laughs> we'll take care of that. Does, that. does that fix it? Very good. Um, infinity, and then we'll um, stop here. And the example is so trivial that we'll start Wednesday's lecture with a much more interesting example. So if I do x minus 2y equals minus 2, and I call that c point 1, obviously, and I do 3x minus 6y equals minus 6. And where's my nice little... <clears throat> okay. So the first equation really says that 2y equals x plus 2, so y is a half, x plus 1, and so it looks something like this. Now, what does the second equation graph to? The same. the same, right? So here's the second equation, OK? So that's this one. That's this one. And so clearly, the problem we have is that x plus 2 equals 2y. And so the equation is y equals a half x plus 1. But x is arbitrary. And we'll write that as x is anything in the real numbers. OK? And this is all the solutions. OK, so these little hand calculations we're doing, 
How's that going to work when we have 100 equations and 100 unknowns? <laughs> Not very well, right? How many of you can do four equations and four unknowns quickly without making an error? Humility, look. <laughs> You're all practicing humility, OK? So the thing is, you can't do it, OK? So there has to be another way to represent the equations where we can bring in the power of computation. And then we'll see that the most obvious way to attack that doesn't look very appealing either. And we'll start looking for special structure in our equations. And that's going to lead us on a road that's going to open up linear algebra in a new way, even if you've already studied linear algebra. And those of you who haven't, you won't be tainted by having thought about it in the wrong way, OK? So this is where we will stop. I will post.